So um, now let's go to part two. So now let's talk about, let's define ECH. Um, so first of all, um, let me tell you what the, so ECH is a homology theory, and I'll tell you what the generators are. So an orbit set, so let, let's fix things again. So we fix um, a three manifold, we fix a context structure, a context form, and we fix a cylindrical almost complex structure. Almost complex structure on the simplectization. Okay. So now, an orbit set is a finite set um, that I'm going to call alpha. So it's alpha i, m i, where alpha i is a Rabe orbit, or the alpha i's are distinct simple Rabe orbits. And mi is the multiplicity. So mi is a, is a is a natural number that's not 0. So it's, it's, an, it's a yeah, positive integer, at least 1. Okay? And there is a technical condition, which I'm not going to say very much about. But the technical condition is that m i is 1 if alpha i is hyperbolic. Okay, So this condition is important for things to work out for d squared equals 0 to be equal to 0, but I, I won't explain why today. OK, so you know we take sets of rib orbits with multiplicities. And I'll define, we can define ECC. So this is the Z2. I'm actually going to do everything without signs, which we can do in ECH. And actually, all the applications are good, uh, even without signs. So uh, we don't need to worry about signs. Um, so it's a Z2 vector field generated by the orbit sets. And now we want to define a differential uh, which will take a little time to do. But the idea is that it counts j holomorphic curves between two orbit sets. So this sentence actually contains quite a lot of math. So the j holomorphic curves part, I think, is already explained. The counts is kind of a very hard word to make sense of. And uh, between, I should also say it's not, I have to clarify what this means. OK? So let me just say a couple of things, maybe a comment for the experts, for people who have seen these kinds of things before. This is the same philosophy of any kind of contact homology. So cylindrical contact homology or the general symplectic field theory is that, well, we want to count geohomorphic curves between uh, sets of rib orbits. Okay? But there is some specific things here. So the first thing is that, well, when we say count, what's behind here is that you actually want to look at only rigid holomorphic curves. So you want to look at holomorphic curves, which live in a zero-dimensional moduli space, which hopefully is compact. So you can count the number of points. Okay? And this between two orbit sets is also a point that is very important, very subtle, which is that usually, you know, if I look at my moduli space like this, then I look at orbit at j holomorphic curves, with co which converge to a bunch of rib orbits in the positive ends and a bunch of rib orbits in the negative ends. But these rib orbits here, they can be multiply covered. You know, I could have an end of my holomorphic curve, which is converging to a rib orbit going several times. And I can have the same. Uh, the same curve several times. You know, like, for example, an element of a moduli space there is, you know, I could have 
here's a rape orbit, and there's an end that's like covering it twice, and then I could have another end going to the same orbit. So in this, uh, in the classical way of thinking about it, this, is, this would be mo the moduli space, uh, which, convert, which has one end converging to this rape orbit going twice, and it has another end converging to this rape orbit going once. But my generator of ECH is a little bit different. My generator of ECH, I'm requiring that these alpha i's are distinct, and then I, I encode all the multiplicity in one number. Okay? So the, the, the word that's behind this is the, is, the, is the idea of currents. So it's basically, I don't care how much, how the, the, this holomorphic curves are converging to the, the, this orbit with which multiplicities each end is converging, but I want the total multiplicity uh, of this of this rape orbit to be equal to this mi. Okay, so that's uh, that's what uh, ECH is going to look at. So um, yeah, so we're gonna so let's say that we fix orbit sets alpha alpha i m i and beta which is beta j and j. So now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to write down what I just said. So what are the holomorphic curves that we're interested in? Like what are the holomorphic curves that are in between alpha and beta? So we want to look at j holomorphic curves uh, from sigma j to the asymplectization. such that the total, the total multiplicity of the positive ends at alpha i is m i, and the total multiplicity of the negative ends at beta j is n j. OK? So that's what we're going to look at. So it, does, it won't matter for anything, you know, at least for the basic definitions, how we converge to, you know, if you have two, uh, if, if you have an end that's covering this twice and another end covering it once, or if you just have an end covering it three times, or if you had three separate ends covering it once. I just want to care about the total multiplicity uh, of the positive ends at each rave orbit. OK? So the set of these guys we can denote by the m of alpha beta. It's the moduli space of curves that go between alpha and beta. Okay? And to be you know, even more uh, careful, it doesn't really matter. If you have multiple covers, it doesn't really matter what the, the multiple cover, how, how the covering map is. So you actually only think, you only want to think about this as a simple curve with some multiplicity. OK, so this is a, very, a technical thing. And I'm actually going to write uh, c for the holomorphic curve. And I'm not going to really write the map. I'm just going to write sort of C as the image. OK? So um, well, now I can define probably the most important thing, which is the ECH index. So this is, I guess, the, the main big idea, the first main big idea. Uh, so Hutchings. Define the following thing. So, given a C in this space, a J holomorphic current, or a J holomorphic curve if you want, um, you define this I of C to be the first turn class, uh, well, I'm going to write it like this uh, C uh, first turn class uh, with respect to tau uh, plus a term that has to do with self intersections plus some colleague Xander um, term. And I'm going to explain all these terms. And actually, I should say that the idea from, of to do this came from the 90s. So in the 90s, Taubes proved that the cyberwritten invariant of a symplectic form manifold is equal to some count of holomorphic curves in the manifold. And what kind of count? He said, well, don't take all the holomorphic curves in this symplectic manifold, but just take the ones that have a certain index being 0. And it's a topological index. And then he showed that it, with that extra condition, all the curves would be rigid, so you can count them all. And that number would be equal 
to the cyber with an invariant. So that was the story in the 90s. And then Hutchings in the 2000s, kind of the idea was he wanted to do the same in a categorified way, so in three dimensions. So in three dimensions, there isn't just cyber written invariants, but there is cyber written homology. So Hutchins looked at that, that Kronheim and Rovka had, had written down about and had been talking about for some years, and tried to do the same for holomorphic curves and simplectizations. And he's like, well, I need an index like the one in four dimensions. So he wrote down this index. And everything worked out. So let me tell you what it, how it worked out. So he defined this index. And uh, well, let me tell you what the, the, the elements are. So the C tau is the, the relative first turn class. So this is uh, the first turn class of C with respect to tau evaluated at u, which I wrote down before in the formula for the Fred Home Index. Actually, let me just clarify, you know, what is the first turn class? I think probably most of you, many, most of you should know that. It's, you know, have a, an oriented real bundle. So it's the obstruction to trivializing the bundle. So in other words, you try to find an, a never vanishing section of the bundle, and then you just see where it has a zero, so where, where it fails to be an ever vanishing section. Or you choose a, a generic section of the bundle, and you see where it has a zero. So that's what the first string class is of a bundle on some surface. Except that in this case, your surface is non-compact. So that number is not well defined, unless you do something like you fix a trivialization. So fixing a trivialization, so this tau is a trivialization of uh, the context structure over all of the rave orbits, alpha i and beta j. So when you do that, that means that you have a, a canonical, you can choose a non-zero section, a never vanishing section, along those curves, at the top and at the bottom. And then you can extend the section in the middle, and then you can see how many zeros it has. You can count the number of zeros. So that's what's called the relative first turn class. Any questions about this? OK. So the second term is the self-intersection. Uh, so the idea is, well, you have some surface, and you perturb it, and then you have another, you know, you have, this, you have a self-intersection. Then you, you can count the number of intersections. OK, so you can do that in dimension four, for example, for closed uh, surfaces. Uh, but again, we have a non-compact manifold. So it's a little bit complicated. You know, if, I, if I take a surface like this, and I perturb it, you know, um, then I have some intersections. But actually, I can actually get rid of intersections, or, in, or I, can put, I can create or remove intersections by just taking intersections to infinity. So this is something you can, you can realize, and I don't have time to explain that, but it's, 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 see, it's not very hard to see that this is not well defined if you have non-compact surfaces. So you need to put some restriction at the ends to say kind of what's happening. So one way is to actually you know, say, I want to perturb this curve to another curve so that at the ends, they're, they're trivial with respect to each other. And I don't want to explain what that means in terms of you know, what, what it means to be trivial at infinity. But what you can do is you can perturb it in any way that you want. So you know, take another uh, C prime, which is, it actually doesn't even matter. Uh, you can just consider a C prime, which is just in the same homology class, a relative homology class as C, that is transverse to C. And then you can count the number of intersections. Uh, but then you have to compensate for what's happening at the ends. So what you do is you subtract what's called the asymptotic linking number of the two. OK, so when you, when you get towards the ends, each of these two are going to be, when you take the intersection with a slice, they're both going to be braids around the, 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 the rave orbits alpha i and beta j with this number of strands, m i or n j. So for each rave orbit, you're going to have a braid that's, that's spinning around so many times for both of them. And then you compute the linking number. So this is the term that you need to compensate. And then the last term is this Kohn-Alexander index term, uh, which, again, is you know, something that's not obvious. So uh, let me write it down. And uh, so this Kohn-Alexander index actually only depends on alpha and beta. And it's some kind of combinatorial thing that doesn't make a lot of sense from the holomorphic curve's perspective. But it is what, it is what we need it to be. 
So this is going to be, basically, you take the Collins-Zander index of each alpha i to the k, where k goes from 1 to m i, and then you take the sum over all i. So if the total multiplicity is m i for a certain Rabe orbit alpha i, what you do is you take the Collins-Zander index of all its covers from 1 all the way to m i, and you take the sum. And then you subtract the same thing for the negative ends, beta j k, where k goes from 1 to n j, and you sum over j. So this is kind of, this is probably the most obscure term in the ECH index. Okay, Because the natural thing to do is what, you, what we wrote down in the Fredholm index is like you take each end, and you compute the Collins under index of the end with the multiplicity that appears there. Okay, But anyway, this is, this is what it is. So we have this formula. Okay, so that's the ECH index. Uh, and here is the magic of ECH, the first magic of ECH. So theorem, suppose J is generic, then, and you have, and you have a curve between alpha and beta. So, zero. If the ECH, first of all, then the ECH index, first of all, is always positive, or is always non-negative. And then if the ECH index is zero, then C is a union of multiply covered, or possibly multiply covered, trivial cylinders. OK? So actually, I should have said in the definition of the moduli space, uh, I said the dimension was the index. But I forgot to say they have to divide by homomorphisms of the domain. OK, so that's a technical thing you have to do. But what happens is for if, if you have a holomorphic curve, which is not a cylinder, and it exists, so if we have transversality and, and you see this holomorphic curve, then you, can, you have this R action. You can translate the curve up and down. So you always have a one degree of, you know, family, which means that it has to you know, the, the index of this, the Fredholm index, which is the dimension of the space in which it lives, has to be at least one. So the only case when you, have, when you can have a holomorphic curve with, um, and I should say, and the Fredholm index is equal to the ECH index. So the only case that you can have a, um, a holomorphic curve with zero index in a transverse problem, in a transverse moduli space, is if it is a trivial cylinder or a multiple cover of trivial cylinders. And, that, and, the, and the, the first part of the theorem is that ECH index 0 implies that. Okay. So, so if the ECH index is 1, then C is the this joint union of two guys, where the first one has ECH index 0, and therefore is it a union of multiply covered trivial cylinders. And the second guy has Fredholm index also equal to 1. And C1 is embedded. So it's not only a simple holomorphic curve, but it's also embedded. It doesn't have any self-intersections, which is an extremely strong statement. And this embedded here is the reason why the, the, the theory is called embedded contact homology. So the name is, is a little funny name, because it's not like the contact homology is embedded. But it's, uh, it's just to code that the contact homology m is mostly counting embedded things. OK, so this curve is embedded. And if the ECH index is 2, then it's a similar thing. Then C is C0 union C2, where the same conditions, but with 1 replaced by 2. OK, any questions about this statement? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a little, I'm, I'm kind of uh, abusing notation a little bit. Because M of alpha beta is basically a set of currents, and a current is like an equivalence class of holomorphic curves. Yeah. 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 Yes. That's right. Yeah. But what this is saying is that, you know, if you, if you just look at the ECH index of this thing, then every sort of representative of it actually has to have Fred Home index 1. Exactly, for low value. But it's actually stronger than this. Like, if you, if you really look at the, you know, the proof and you understand this, it'll tell you that if you have in ECH index 0, 1, or, or 2, I mean, the 0 is the easy case, but 1 or 2, not only do you have this condition that it's embedded and it's uh, cut out transversely of the right dimension, but there is an, uh, the way that the, the ends are, um, the total multiplicity is covered by the ends is given. So there's only one way that works. So that, those are called the partition conditions. So the way that your MI is partitioned according to the ends of the holomorphic curve is, is determined by this condition. So there's, there's just one behavior where you can have a holomorphic curve like that. So it's not possible, for example, for the example you gave, it's not possible that you have two uh, ECH1 or two uh, index curves that converge to some, to some specific orbit, you know, one with multiplicities 5 and 5 and another one with multiplicity 10. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, so zero can be empty for sure. Yeah. 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 A union which could be a, an empty union. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, What should I say now? Okay, so now you can see that, now we can define the differential if you believe this theorem. Now given an orbit set alpha, if alpha is a generator, then you can define the alpha to be, uh, oh, actually, so now if, if you take two, two orbit sets, um, so if alpha and beta are orbit sets, we can define uh, the set of curves with ECH index 1 from alpha to beta. And by this theorem, this is going to be a finite set. Okay? And it's also compact. So this is also compact. Okay. So it's finite because you know every time you have a component that's not a trivial cylinder, then it has uh, Fred Holm index 1. So when you quotient by the R action, it's, it, it lives in a space of zero dimension. And it's also compact, which is another thing I don't want to talk about. Um, but the point is that, that the number of points in, in the set is finite. And actually, like I told you, we only really need to count them up to sign. So really, I don't need to orient any moduli spaces. So now we can define the dif ECH differential to just be, just like any Morse floor homology, you just count the number of points in this moduli space um, from alpha beta up to sign, and you multiply to beta. Multiply by beta. Okay, and I mean, for the sum to be finite, you have to know that there are only finitely many beta betas such that this is non-zero. But I will omit this from the discussion. It's true. Okay, so this is the differential. 
to show it's well defined, we need to know this, and we need to know the space is compact, and that's pretty hard. Uh, but then to show that d squared equals zero, it's even harder. So I guess theorem by Hutchins and Taubes. D is well defined, and d squared equals zero. Okay, so this, these are hard theorems, but for, for the specialists here, they're hard, but they don't really n rely on polyfolds, which means that they're not that hard. I mean, no, they are hard. You need obstruction bundle gluing and pretty technical stuff, but it's only 200 pages, and it's been written down rigorously for uh, over 10 years. So that's a good sign. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's only 200 pages and doesn't need any crazy transversality. Um, so we can uh, sleep well. <laughs> huh? I don't think it's going to make it that much easier. The, does Michael say it's going to really help? Yeah, I, I don't think so because... The hardest part here is actually the obstruction bundle gluing. So, so you know, in, in some way, think there, there are things that look harder than SFT, because you, you need, you, you have these, uh, because of the partition conditions. Like, okay, let me just explain this real quick for the specialists, or for Umberto, and I don't know if anyone else you know, knows exactly what I'm talking about. But when these holomorphic curves break, uh, when you glue them, you know, you kind of have to match the ends. But the problem is that they don't match because of these partition conditions. And they act, you, know, you, can, you can prove that the partitions at the, at the negative ends and the positive ends never match. So what happens is you need like an index zero thing in the middle to glue them. So you need some uh, multiple cover of trivial cylinders that actually glues the, the negative ends of one and the positive ends of the other. And you have to show that that's exactly what appears in the compactification of the space. And that's one of the places you use the, the fact that hyperbolic guys have multiplicity one. Um, but anyway, but on the other hand, like the hard part of transversality is usually to deal with non-simple non curves, and they don't appear here for somewhat trivial reasons. I mean, they're not trivial, but the theorem is not that hard compared to these 200 pages. OK, so let's move on. So d squared is 0, and we have a homology. which in principle also depends on the j that I choose. OK? All right, so let's compute an example. So now let's go to the part of examples. And let's see how far we can get. Um, so three examples. So let me do one example proper, you know, carefully, and then the other one I'll just allude to. So the example I'm going to do properly is let's consider the boundary of the ellipsoid, which I already defined, with the standard uh, Liouville form. So this is uh, just the sum 1 half of xi dyi minus yi dxi. OK? So when I restrict lambda to, to y, I get a contact form. OK, so this, I see this as a subset of C2. Uh, and then lambda 0 restricted to y is a contact form. OK? So now an exercise is compute the ray vector field. OK, so let me tell you what the answer is. Um, so the ray vector field is 2 pi times 1 over, oh, let me rewrite this in polar coordinates. So I can, I can rewrite this. Uh, Contact form as one half sum of r i squared d theta i, where r i well, r one and theta one are uh, polar coordinates, or r i and theta i are polar coordinates for z i. Okay, so I can rewrite my contact form like this, and I can compute the ray vector field. So this is an exercise that it has to be two pi times 1 over a d d theta 1 plus 1 over b d d theta 2. OK? So that means that if I take a point on the ellipsoid, the ray flow is not going to change the norm of z1 and the norm of z2. So r, the, flow, uh, the ray flow, 
preserves uh, R1 and R2. Okay? So if I fix R1 and I fix R2, what do I have? I have a torus, usually. Right? If I, if I fix norm of Z1 and norm of Z2, then over that I just have the theta 1 and the theta 2. So I have a torus. Um, so what I need to understand is how this rate flow uh, foliates the torus. So I'm going to assume that A over B is irrational. So what does that mean? That means that the rate flow, I mean, it's going to rotate in the theta 1 direction with speed 1 over A times 2 pi, and then the other one with speed 1 over B. But if I choose the quotient to be irrational, that means that you know, the, the rate flow is never going to close up. Right, so if I take uh, R1 and R2 to be different from 0, then the rate flow never closes up. Which means that there are only two other, you know, there, what are the points that are not here? Well, it's only when R1 is 0 or when R2 is 0. Okay, so when R2 is 0, I have one rave orbit. And when R1 is 0, I have the other one. So, uh, so I have two Rabe orbits. So I have the orbit lambda, uh, gamma 1, which is uh, when R2 is equal to 0. So this is contained in C times 0. And I have an orbit gamma 2, which is when R1 is 0, which is contained in 0 times C. So under the stereogra stereographical projection, I can see them like this. So here's gamma 1. It's a hop flink in S3. Okay. So this is kind of a perturbed, you know, if, you, if, you, if you've looked at pictures of the hop fibration, you know, you, you have these tori, uh, but in, instead of having, you know, a closed, if A equals B equals 1, for example, we have the standard uh, hop fibration picture. But if you make it irrational, then you have kind of the same tori, but now they're foliated by things that don't close up. So you just have two actual ray orbits. Okay. So if you believe that you, know, you could actually have something inf infinitely many ray orbits, this is a counterexample. So this is, you, you see there's exactly just two simple ray orbits. So what can we do? Uh, well, first thing, we can compute the, um, well, now we want to compute the ECH index of these ray of, uh, so first notice that uh, now a generator, oh, we can see that these are elliptic. They're both elliptic. And we can choose a trivialization. And I'm going to choose the, tr the kind of the blackboard trivialization here, so it's, which is given by, you know, if I pick this disk here and I trivialize it like the boundary of this disk. And the same thing for the other one. So pick, um, pick sort of the blackboard. Trivialization. And then if you pick that trivialization, then the first turn class of basically the disk that's bounding gamma 1, uh, I'm going to just write it like this. Yeah. So the first turn class from gamma 1 to the empty set, so just the, the, the disk corresponding to this guy here, is going to be 1. Because the, 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 the context structure has a singularity in here. So this is just 1. So if you put a k here, this is going to be k. And the first string class of gamma 2 to the k is also k. OK. And then on the self-intersection term, well, let's just write, like, if you actually have gamma 1 to the m and gamma 2 to the n, so if you, if you look at the orbit set, I'm going to stop writing relative to the empty set. So if you look at uh, this orbit set, uh, and then you look at the, the first string class with respect to the empty set, so of, of a curve that uh, bounds this guy. You know? So you have this k times, and you have this k times. And the ECH index is completely topological, so you could just do it in, with smooth topology. So this is just going to be m plus n. OK, so the next thing you might want to know is the self-intersection term. And then here, it's pretty easy because of the trivialization I chose. You can just move this disk up 
you know, k times this disk up, and you can move n times this disk this way. And then the self, the intersection is just going to be the, basically the linking number of the 2 times 2. So this is another exercise in smooth topology, that this is 2 mn. And I think, you know, the interesting part now is the Colin-Zander index. So what's the Colin-Zander index here? So how do we compute the Colin-Zander index? Remember, what we do is we look at the linearized flow on the transverse section, so on, on, the, on the contact direction. You, you look at the linearized rate flow and see how it gets back. So you want to see the rotation, how, how the linearized rate flow rotates uh, the contact uh, structure. Okay? So basically, we have to look at the transverse direction. So as I go along gamma 1, what happens is the transverse direction is rotating by, with the speed two, 2 pi over b. So to close up a cycle, I have to actually go time a. So the period um, of gamma 1 is a. So the period of gamma 1 is a. That's easy to see. Um, that's how long you need, you need to get back to the same point. So um, the Colin-Zander index will be, well, what's the rotation number? I'm going to go around time a, but I'm going to be rotating you know, 2 pi 1 over b. So that means that the rotation number, and I, you know, I, I do things in R mod z, so the rotation number of gamma 1 is exactly a over b. So which means that the Colin-Zander index of gamma 1 is twice a over b, uh, the floor of a over b plus 1, by the formula that i written before. OK? So now we can put it all together and, co and compute the, the ECH index of a general guy. So the ECH index of a general orbit, which is gamma 1 to the m, gamma 2 to the n, and well, I should just say that you know I said that I, I I told you about the ECH index of a curve, but that's a topological thing. You can just look at the ECH index of a surface. But here, you know, if you take a surface between any uh, an orbit like this and the empty set, it's not going to depend on the surface. So I can just do that guy. The second homology of the sphere is zero, so everything is homologous. So I can just uh, compute the ECH index as an absolute gradient. OK, so now we just have to, comp to sum these three guys. So the first term class, remember that I have three terms in the ECH index. I have the term class. I have the self-intersection. And I have the Colin-Zander term. Um, OK, so I if I put all of them together, I'm going to have m plus n plus 2mn. And then plus some funny sums. Actually, yeah, that's right. So I have the sum of um, twice k a over b plus 1. So if I take an, a copy of, k one, of gamma 1, I have a k here. OK, so I have a k here if I take a k-fold cover. So I have this plus the sum of 2, and then it's not so hard to see that if you do it for ge gamma 2, you're going to have the same thing, but with b over a instead of a over b. So you have 2 times the floor of k b over a plus 1. And here you sum from 1 to m. And here you sum from 1 to n. OK, so now we can uh, compute the sum. <coughs> And uh, this is going to be, well, this is an m, this is an n. So it's 2 m plus n, well, plus mn plus the sum of k a over b. No, k is inside. k equals 1 to m plus the sum of k b over a, k equals 1 to n. OK, so that's what the ECH index is for this uh, uh, 
orbit set. So the first thing you can see is that it's even. Okay, so that's great. When you're trying to compute homology and everything has even grading, and you know the differential decreases grading by one, that means the differential has to be zero. So differential is zero, which means that the homology is equal to the chain complex. So every generator is an, a homology element. So all we need to know to compute the homology is what are all the generators? Well, we know all the generators have this form. So we have to see you know, how, how many are there in each grading. So we know there are only positive grading, I mean, positive um, non-negative even gradings. And you have to see which even numbers are actually attained. OK? So this could be an exercise, but um, well, let me tell you how, how you do that. This just simple combinatorics. But so the question is, how many, or which even numbers are attained by this formula? Which even numbers are attained by this formula? Okay. So, well, I'm just going to draw a picture, and you'll see what happened. So here's a graph, and pick the number m and n. So first of all, uh, notice that this part of the sum is just m plus 1 times n plus 1 minus 1. Okay. So if you take m and n, uh, it's not hard to see that this, rec this rectangle here, it has the number of lattice points in this rectangle, the number of integer points here, is exactly m plus, m plus 1 times n plus 1. So this m plus 1 times n plus 1 is exactly the number of lattice points that live in this rectangle. OK, so lattice points. Now, you do the following thing. Now is the trick. You look at the line with slope minus a over b. And then you notice the following thing. So if you look at the lattice points in here, that is exactly the same as this sum. <coughs> so you start, you know, for if you take this point 1, there will be some lattice points here if, k over k if uh, a over b is bigger than 1. And there will be 0 if it's not. And then all these lines, if you count the, the lattice points in all these integer lines, you're going to have exactly each term of the sum. And then for this guy, you have the same thing here. <coughs> so the point is that this number here, minus, uh, without the 1, without the minus 1, is exactly the number of lattice points that are contained in this triangle. OK? So the index of the generator corresponding to this guy is twice the number of lattice points in this triangle minus 1. And now if we, know, if we assume that a over b is irrational, notice that that means that there's only one integer point on this line. So that, that means that there's no other generator with the same index. So this implies that there's only one generator for each even number, and exactly one. Okay, So there is exactly one. For each positive even number. Okay, so so the, the answer the the conclusion is that ECH of Y lambda, you can put this absolute grading. This is gonna be Z2 if star is 0, 2, 4, etc., and 0 otherwise. Any questions? OK. So this is something you can actually check by yourself. I think you sh you know, it should be it's a fun little exercise. OK. So um, 
I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't have time to talk about another example, but I did want to say a little more. I did want to say at least either uh, some more technicalities to prove that theorem, or the definition of the ECH spectrum variance in capacities. Which one would people prefer? Can you say it again? So either I can talk about ECH capacities, the definition, or I can say a little bit more about the technicalities and why ECH index 1 forces things to be really good. Let me say your definition. Okay. All right. So I'll just say the definition of the ECH capacities and ECH spectral invariant. So I said that ECH, because of uh, Taub's isomorphism with Cyberwit and floor homology, ECH is a topological invariant. So it doesn't depend on anything, just the manifold. But if you have a contact form, you can put extra structure on ECH. So there's an action filtration. So it goes like this. So we fix a three manifold and we fix a contact form. So now for an orbit set, I can define the action of the orbit set to be what's you know, usually called the symplectic action. It's just the integral of lambda over alpha i times mi and i sum. OK, so I have this number. Um, <coughs> and the, you know, the point of this is, well, I can, now I can consider the, um, a sub, a, you know, in principle, just a subset of the chain complex which is given by, uh, it's generated by the orbit sets with action less than L. And then one observation is that if a term, if a, if a holomorphic curve appears, then it has to decrease this action. So if C is a holomorphic curve, uh, then the integral of d lambda over c is the action of a minus the action of b by Stokes' theorem. And because of, of the holomorphic condition, the compatibility of j and, and lambda, this has to be bigger than or equal to 0. So that means that the holomorphic curve has to decrease action or can't increase action, which means that d preserves the set. So d preserves the set, so it's actually a subcomplex. So it has a homology. So when you take homology, this is what's called ECHL. So this is filtered ECH. OK? Um, and of course, now this, this filtered ECH depends very strongly on lambda. So if I, if I multiply my lambda by some number, you know, everything gets multiplied or divided. You know, there, it, has, it gets rescaled. So now I can define the spectral invariant, which is actually something that's done in lots of homology theory. So it's not exclusive to ECH. So if I take a homology class, which is something, you know, that doesn't depend on lambda or anything, I can ask what's the smallest action required to represent this sigma? And this is called the spectral invariance. So it's denoted by C uh, sigma of y lambda. So this is the infimum of L such that the sigma is in the ECH L. This doesn't make, exact, doesn't make a lot of sense because the, the filtered homology is not contained in the, in the full homology, but there is a map. So the right way to say this is, what's the smallest L? So that sigma is in the image of the map from ECH L to ECH. So this number here is called the spectral invariant. OK? So this kind of thing is done in many different homologies. Um, so this is the, the one for ECH. And one of the reasons it's really nice is that it gives rise to capacity. So there exists, there is a way of choosing classes in ECH, sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, etc. 
And then we, de we can define CK to be um, this C sigma K. Okay, so I don't have time to explain how to define these classes. If you're interested, I can say something in the afternoon. Um, but the idea is now if you have a, if you have a Liouville domain uh, with a contact boundary, then you define the ECH capacity of the domain to be this spectral invariant of the boundary. And then you, you have to prove all the properties, but you can do that. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you.